Hi, everyone. Welcome to Journeys with PDA Coffee Chat Podcast, where we seek connection, community, and co regulation while discussing all things PDA. Welcome to Journeys with PDA Coffee Chat Podcast. I'm Caressa. And I'm Heather. Today we have a special guest, Suzanne Gunn from the motherload.nd.sleep. She's a certified infant and family sleep specialist. We're really excited to talk about sleep. Thank you for being with us, Suzanne. And go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, so yes, so um, my uh, business practice is the Motherload Family Sleep Specialist. So um, the motherload.nd.sleep is my Instagram handle, and that is actually where I am most active on social media. So if you want to come and join me on that, please do. Um, I share a lot of things in real time on my stories about sleep. I am a fellow neurodivergent, so um, I have, back in February, I was diagnosed as ADHD, um, which was actually a complete shock to me. I knew that I was autistic since, I mean, very, very familiar situation, like across the board, experience across the board. It was when my eldest son was going through the assessment process. And all the way through the process, there was like questions like, oh, and what does he do like this and this and this? And I'm like totally confusing family and generational traits with autistic traits. I'm like, yeah, but he just mm -hmm. gets that from me. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. but he just gets that from mm -hmm. me. Like, stop pathologizing him. Mm -hmm. I'm he's just my son. <laughs> and so there was that. And um so I I'm here in this space as a neurodivergent specializing um, infant and family sleep specialist because um, essentially as I needed to go needed as in for myself so we were just emerging from PDA burnout in the household my two children have PDA um, for which we only just very, very recently found out that my youngest has PDA because he presented so differently from my eldest. We were emerging from PDA burnout back um, 2020 because the pandemic was a godsend for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to get out of, I wanted to get my headspace out of this, uh, the constant PDA family-ness. I needed to explore other roles of myself and I really wanted to get back to work. I had been feeling like I really want to do this for so long, um, but it was always a case of like, you know, of course you put your kids first and if it's a choice, you will always choose the, the route that may allow your children to thrive. And so that meant that I stayed at home for a long time. Um, and so I decided I needed like a, a flexible work around my kids kind of thing. And as I was trying to figure things out in what I could do, what have I possibly been doing all this time? Like that it felt like waste, a wasted time when it came to a career. And then I realized, well, actually, you know what? I've had to do some really, really, really deep learning about my sons, my neurology, their, sorry, their neurology, myself, everything. And I thought, I think I need to go on this career path of like helping other families. And I have always been dead against behaviorist modes. Like when it came to the, the thing of like sleep training, um, the thought of using my connection with my son as a bargaining tool and to trying to get him to disconnect from me in his most vulnerable times was something that just felt so, um, so wrong. And I also felt other people's pain, like obviously being, being autistic ADHD, like I have a very heightened sense of empathy. So I decided I really wanted to go into the realm of supporting families. 
And um, so I found this amazing course run by Dr. Gria Kirschenbaum, who is a neuroscientist. And um, she's actually just released her first book, which is called The Nurture Revolution. And I thought there is just nothing more aligned with who I am than essentially helping other families heal. And when I, right, when I say heal, I know that there is like so many like trigger points that I'm not about like any kind of quote unquote, like curing oh, oh, neurodivergence, anything like that. But it's, it's a really, really hard journey when we are like down in those deep depths of like PA mm -hmm. burnout mm -hmm. and there is a healing to do. Um, and so um, I actually first off trained as an infant uh, more so like, sorry, what I'm trying to say is on the infant side, uh, the the neurodiversity doesn't really tend to um, be noticed very often um, because it's just like, there's usually something else, right? It's usually like a tongue tie or like um, inappropriate expectations, um, oh, sorry, unrealistic expectations. Um, but I soon started to realize, oh, wait, I think that a lot of the people who were being drawn to me are also neurodivergent. And then I realized um, I don't see anybody else supporting neurodivergent children with their sleep. And so I was like, this field, like there, there is a gap there of support needs. And at first I was like, um, I don't know if I could do this. So I, um, I, you know, um, uh, I want to say subsidized wrong word. Sorry. My words do get completely mixed up and some of them are just like, Oh, I can't quite reach the right word, but, um, so I went and I did a whole load of other training to, um, to kind of like bridge that gap between, um, the range of infant sleep going into childhood adolescent, along with neurodivergence in a very anti behavioralist mode. Um, uh, because I think that the last thing that any child needs is, um, is to be made to do something that they don't feel is safe. Um, and I feel like I have found my life's calling with this. So oh, now I'm just like, okay, I love that. A really long introduction. I'm really sorry if I did. I'm like, did I, did I actually introduce myself? I guess I did. Mm -hmm. There you go. So that, yes, that, that's a, that's amazing. Um, so H Heather and I have very similar stories with our, our children, um, and their sleep issues. And, um, so my daughter is 13 and she is my PDA -er. and, um, I, I had, I had no support. I had no answers and I, I mm. didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do, but, um, I knew that I just had this little girl who actually just would, she just wouldn't sleep. And I would like read the books, but then nothing felt right. And it, and it didn't, like it didn't work, you know? Um, the classic of like, oh, let them cry it out. And then they'll, they'll like, oh, see no. the, it, yes. and they, yes. and the, and like the part that's so hard is I was it's so, so tired and I was so yeah. desperate. Um, yeah. And so, we're, you know, my husband and I were like, we're going to try this because that's what the books say. And, yeah. and I, I remembered it just like crying while yeah. we were letting her cry it out. But the thing yeah. was, is, um, she, like, she could marathon cry. Like she was not, go <laughs> like, she was not going to s stop. And, and so we have a huge long history of you know, sleep issues. And, um, and so I have a, um, a son who is 11 and he's got his own whole set of sleep issues. Um, and, and so there's, a, there's a, always a lot of questions that we hear with sleep. Um, mm. they come up a ton. Some of the questions, of course, I think one of the top is, um, 
how do how do electronics and screen time play into that um yeah. you know like what if they don't want to sleep like how do you make them go to sleep um that's one of our big questions that we that yeah. we hear um and so the whole like how do you make them in any context you know heather and i are like Oh, funny. Yeah. You don't. No, so. <laughs> there are so many points. There's so many points. I'm sorry to like talk over you. I'm so sorry. Um, it's my impulsivity. I'm like excited to, to talk about this stuff. Um, there's so many points that I would love to speak about with this. The first is, right, the sleep books were not written with us in mind. And um you when you really look back on the beginnings of sleep training and all that kind of thing um i mean firstly we can go and like discuss around the like com contemporary narrative around sleep training is very much like we have to do it it is something that we have to teach our baby you have to teach your baby to sleep right um and that if you don't go through this then, um, you know, you're somehow failing yourself and them. Mm -hmm. um, and when you really look into like when it started, it's a relatively recent thing. Um, the, the people who started the whole like behavioral line were um, white middle class men who had never cared for a baby. Um, and they, they basically just wanted their wives back in the bedroom right without a child and then when you look anthropologically at infants and sleep we are a carrying species our baby's nervous systems are not fully developed for a very 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 long time and um this whole like sleeping alone biologically speaking is actually very dangerous for babies um so and, and when you consider like the last, you know, few decades, a century, it's just this tiny, tiny, tiny blip in our evolution. And we weren't really meant to be sleeping alone. And also our genetics don't know that. Like our genetics don't know that we have like safe houses and there's not like cougars mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. lions and, and all this type of thing. And they don't know that we have like air conditioning and, and all that type of stuff. And also, they have really, really, really small bellies. So they need to be nursing or at least feeding frequently. That is their biology to do that. Um, then um, the, the next piece of that is, is that we tend to be in this culture of pushing independence far, far earlier than what is biologically appropriate for any child. So that is really like, that whole pushing for independence. And so now I'm going a little bit further on in the age timeline of when we kind of are expecting like toddlers and preschoolers to be able to like go, like you go in and you like, you read them a story and then you leave and you shut the door. And actually that's inappropriate at that age, biologically and emotionally speaking. And there are always like anomalies within these groups, right? Because we're not like, we're uniquely human of course, in, in every way. Um, but we are told to like teach our children independence. Um, but we're getting this like the complete wrong way around. We don't teach children to be independent by forcing it upon them until they're like surviving it. We're actually needing to be essentially teaching their nervous systems to mm -hmm. be and, and when i say i want to say independent but really we are not a species that should be alone we are a community species we're a village species we didn't thrive as a race like until until we we had like communities i think that they actually i remember somewhere hearing about how they figured out the time at which we really started thriving as a species. And it was something about the finding of someone who had um, a femur, a leg bone that was broken and healed. And the way that 
Oh yes, so Heather, you know this. I can see it I in your face. So, and they could, yeah. they could. It was like a child. They could tell it was like a, a child that, who had right. the broken, broken leg mm -hmm. bone. They, they think it was preteen, around twelve. It was a male, and they could I tell. They could tell that, um, this this child had been taken care of by other yes. people by the way it had healed. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, we're not a species that can. We, we barely survive without other people and we don't mm -hmm. thrive with other people. And the same goes for now. We are still human beings. We are still mammals. We are not robots. And I know I'm just like, I want to go into another tangent. Like even a <laughs> robot couldn't like, uh, even a robot couldn't like survive and maintain itself like on its own. Anyway, I, I'll go on in that one. But the next piece of this is, is that Carissa, your daughter, your PDA, -er, she is, you know, what could be described as an orchid. So we have the orchids and we have the dandelion. So we have the dandelion children who essentially can like thrive, like living out of a pavement, right? Mm -hmm. And then the orchid children are the ones that need like a specific pH level of water and they need like exactly this, the right amount of sunlight <laughs> at the right <laughs> angle and the right temperature and everything. But when you are able to fully support all of those things, they are these incredibly beautiful and complex, like plants that everybody is just like, wow, look at the beauty in this. And I also feel a PDA is like, they have this, or at least like external ones. And I'm really sorry if in this narrative, um, I am, you know, missing out a group of people who, have been, you know, traumatized on the big tree, tra big T traumas by not having their needs met. But I feel like PDA is, um, have this inbuilt reaction to being parented in a way that is not what they need. And they fight for what they need and they mm -hmm. will not mm -hmm. stop until they get it. Mm -hmm. And yes. I actually, I find it, um, it's, yeah, okay. I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that PDA parenting is exceptionally hard, especially because we are parenting. When we need the biggest village, we have the smallest village. It's like as soon mm -hmm. as we have additional needs, we are, sub we are isolated because we are mm -hmm. like held outside of that like common narrative. And it's so hard just to be within that like group. Um, but yeah, this, this PDA ness that like, that it's, it's so like, I feel, I feel like as the world is burning down around us right now, don't we just need these human beings who will not stop fighting until they get the justice and like what they need to thrive. And the, just the challenge is like, you know, we don't have a world that is like fully supporting or even and like seeing it for what it is right now, let alone validating it and supporting it and providing a safe space for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, sleep is an incredibly vulnerable time for these people who, um, you know, really do feel, um, I want to say aloneness or like, just like not really truly being safe because of course autonomic nervous system disability does, you know, it's, it's so quick, so easily triggered to go into that like stress response. And at the end of the day, when everything is quiet, there's nothing to distract you from all the thoughts and everything that is going around. And that's the time when you're going to feel the most vulnerable. Okay, so let's let's jump into because this is really relevant to me. Electronics and um, sleep. Let's, I miss let's that jump. One. In, um, let's jump into teenage years. So um, okay. Heather and I both have a thirteen year old, um, and okay. and so now we're we're coming into these teen years, which are mm -hmm. so difficult 
for, and I'm talking about like difficult on this child who mm. like they're changing and, and they're a kid and they want to be a grown up. So this is a hard, hard age. Um, and yeah. then we're going to add everybody- in PDA and being autistic. And then that's really hard. Um, mm. But then sleep, sleep comes in. Yeah. Um, PDAers, yeah. and I, I'm really generalizing, they don't like to sleep. They don't want to go to sleep. <laughs> um, we, we hear a lot, how do you make, how do you make them go to bed? Because I need to go to bed. <laughs> um, and so yeah. that's something yeah. that we, we hear a lot. Um, and yeah. so, so let's chat about, um, how can we, how can we help a PDA get the rest that they need? But, um, let's talk about realistic expectations. Um, because I feel like, you know, I'm right. Sorry. (laughs) I'm actually that, writing down here appropriate expectations. And then you went, yes, expectations. I'm like, yeah, that's it. Um, so, because I, I feel I mean, like, yeah, we, we, we're still as parents holding on to those sleep books that we read 13 years ago. And, and yeah. we're, you know, you that the, like, that's the only thing. Yeah. And that whole, like what you should be doing um and those that what you should do does not work but then that leaves us with um well what you do yeah 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 so let's let's just change that narrative a little bit so there is no making anybody to go to sleep think of sleep as a bodily function the same as breathing digesting sweating like stuff like that like it's like literally it's a it's a it's a biological function and it cannot be forced and then also like you have a pda who is very sensitive to any kind of like demands expectations pressure to do something and there are so many other biological functions within that that like demand avoidance that will stop sleep So if you had a problem with digestion, you wouldn't stick your hand in and squeeze that food around your intestines and make it happen. You're going to like support what's around it and then it will come, it will happen. So let's just like take away that narrative that it is a parent's role to make their child sleep. It's not. And I would love you to take that burden, that very, very heavy burden off yourselves Um, it's as a, as a parent's job, it is, no, let's, let's get away from jobs and whatever. What really we need to be doing around this is supporting your child where they're at. And when you're talking about going into teenage years, um, you, there's, there's a possibility that a few things are going to be combining here. Um, so for instance, a lot of the time, um, no, I'm going to take away a lot. We don't know a lot about sleep and we don't know a lot about neurodivergence. And so when we see statistics and things like that, I'm kind of a bit like, how much can we trust this? Because we have so many neurodivergents who are not listed on the statistics, whether it be because, um, they are not diagnosed or that they are diagnosed and that it hasn't been disclosed. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of issue with data collection. So let's not go with like numbers, but there are things that we know that are commonly co-occurring with neurodivergence. Um, one of these things is um, a delayed sleep phasic um, syndrome. I hate saying syndrome. Basically, it's like, is is your child a night owl or like an early bird? And let's stay away from the pathologizing here. It might be that your child is someone who naturally is predisposed to going to sleep later on. Then when we are like looking at social expectations, there are many social expectations that you're better in, your children are in bed from a particular time, which is usually very, a lot earlier than what the child's natural circadian rhythm is at. And 
Yes, you can kind of like change. Some people can change their their body clocks quite well, actually. Um, but when it comes down to things like, you know, melatonin production and things, you can support things for what they're at, but you cannot force someone's like chronology to be something else. So you might be trying to get your child to get to sleep at a particular time. Let's just say, I don't know, let's just go a little bit earlier on and go like 8.30. Um, and maybe they just haven't built up enough sleep pressure to go to sleep at 8.30. But you're doing all the things and maybe they're also relaxing at that time because you're trying to get them to relax. So as you're trying to get them to go to sleep, they're actually like releasing a lot of that sleep pressure from building. So like, and then it means it gets even later because they can't sleep because they've effectively just been like resting and they still need to be like building up the sleep pressure. Then also you add in a PDA neurology and oh wait, I'm expected to go to sleep. You want me to go to sleep. You're trying to make me to go to sleep. You're telling me, lie down, shut your eyes, be still. No way, I'm gonna fight that. I'm gonna fight that for my life. There's no way. You want me to slow and deep breathe. I'm gonna hyperventilate. You want me to like go to the bathroom. There's no way I will hold it until it hurts. I will, you want me to lie down and close my eyes and be quiet? No way, I am gonna jump on top of this bed and I'm gonna sing and that's all my lungs. Like, you know, whatever it is. And with that, we're not like, when we look at the, the like phases within the nervous system, like the nervous system state. So you have like a baseline level of, um, of regulation and that, that baseline, so that's when you're resting. But at any point of activation, you're going further up. And as you're going further up in this nervous system state activation, that is cortisol being released. And you're going from being like, the baseline is essentially where sleep can happen, where you can drift off. And you need to be at like a certain point of relaxed for your body to let go. But if you're activated, there's no way, there's no way that you can. And the other thing that we also need to bring into this, a very, very important piece of this narrative is, and this is where screens come in. This is where I have a real bugbear around this narrative of like, you must turn screens off within like how, like X amount of time before bed. When we are stressed, when we've had some kind of activation and when i say stress i actually mean a cortisol release and we know cortisol as being the stress hormone but actually that's a very simplistic version cortisol is it's it's a hormone that releases it signals to release glucose into the bloodstream that is essentially like a big whack of sugar into your bloodstream. And you cannot sleep if you have a boatload of sugar going around in your blood system. It's like your body is being primed to move, primed for action. And that happens whether it's a positive um, activation, like they are excited um, like super happy. There's something that is like, you know, you think of any kind of body movement, whether it's jumping around in excitement or wanting to like throw something at the wall, that is energy that needs to be released. That is, that is like glucose that's needing to be released from your system, right? Through, um, through body movement or like other things like play, laughter, you know, it, it could either be movement or it could be feel good hormones that come in to dampen the cortisol and essentially those also help you feel sleepy. Um, but the next stage is, is that once you have been activated and the stress response comes in, it takes a very, very long time for it to in, for it to exit your blood system. And we're talking hours and we don't know exactly because it like depends on your metabolism and all this kind of thing. But if you have been activated because suddenly, and like now I'm just gonna 
completely change the scenario here and imagine that we have a teenager who is somehow dysregulated and it could be like through their senses it could be um like yeah just just general dysregulation through not like being able to support their body or their senses and in various different ways um the interoception might be off they've maybe not like eaten well or maybe they've not eaten at all like whatever it is or they have this heavy heavy need because pda is essentially a need for co-regulation with someone else like on a far more intense basis than the norm um and i want to say the norm because like neurotypicals also need co-regulation with other people like as a species we don't self-regulate we always use a tool of some kind whether it be another human or something that we've taught ourselves usually using some kind of other tool whether it's breath work or like or fidgets or like a nice hot bath or whatever and you have this like teen who is being threatened with taking away what they're currently regulating with they're currently regulating with that screen and it's happened in a way that is maybe jarring to their system it's maybe something that they're just not well prepared for um and then suddenly you're going to have this huge spike in stress and that is going to last for hours so when we then say about you know like typical sleep hygiene and sleep hygiene by the way for anybody who doesn't know like the the what what that is it's nothing to do with cleanliness actually the the wording is terrible as as with most things right um but what it means is the things that we do and the habits and the like brain prediction so like routines and things like that or just like predicting what's going to happen next um that will allow your brain to enter a state that allows you to and your body allows you to get to sleep well and to and to sleep well so to get to sleep and to stay asleep um so when we have this basic and i mean basic in a derogatory way basic sleep hygiene recommendations um kind of like chucked our way as pda parents for things to make our kids do like giving up their screen on demand at a particular time and then when we get this whole like oh they they just need to go to sleep earlier what well uh uh they they don't have a switch like honestly I'm like what do you know what you're talking about here and we've also also got to got must remember pediatricians behavioral consultants i mean like there's there's a whole line of people like that don't have adequate sleep training a general practitioner does not receive infant sleep sleep um no sorry i said i said training i didn't mean to i meant um information education um pediatricians on average get about an hour for their whole um education on infant sleep and then it is not largely up to date because we have so so much like new um new information that's come out with this like boom of neuroscience in the past like mm-hmm. 20 30 years and bear in mind it takes like 20 years for anything to come out really let alone in the mainstream and it also depends on like confirmation bias and things like that because people like to know that they're right and be proved that they're right so when there's something that proves that they're wrong they maybe question it a little bit too much or they take what they want to discard the rest mm-hmm. or whatever it is and when they are you know like giving these like very basic sleep hygiene recommend recommendations of you know quote unquote support which is just like i want to swear and i know that <laughs> must swear um <laughs> it's it's um yeah it's it's really infuriating because it can really exacerbate the problem because then you have parents who are stressed and for kids who need to be co-regulating with it <laughs> parents is like oh hang on so you're taking away the screen that is co-regulating with them then you are making their they're like their their person they're like 
you know, most loved person who they are most attuned with and they are feeling everything that, the, that we are feeling, you're making us stressed. And it's like, who is going to sleep with that? Because if we are to go down to our, like, you know, internal, real, real mammalian selves, which are, which is what drives our natural functions who can be at their most vulnerable so unconscious in a dark room so you're taking away a sense like with the light you might be asking someone to be alone and they cannot regulate on their own um and and vulnerability like being asleep is so vulnerable like Mm -hmm. our it doesn't matter how much that we know our houses are safe. You know, if we have a very, very sensitive neuroception, we, it, yeah, it just, it just doesn't work right. We have to feel ultimately safe. And then by taking away these like co-regulating tools is like absolute BS in many ways. Yes, it does affect sleep. Screens do affect sleep. We know it. We've seen the, we've seen the data is there. There's no contesting that. But what we do need to be thinking about is what would the sleep quality be like without these co-regulating tools? And quite often it would just be so poor. It either wouldn't happen or if it did happen, it likely wouldn't, our bodies may not even like enter, you know, some stages that we do need like deep sleep is highly restorative um REM sleep um it's it's highly restorative to our brains like our our short-term memory um is is cash is essentially like sifted and cleared like to create memories and learning and and like reset everything and then the deep sleep is all about like rest and restoration for our bodies and our nervous system and all this type of thing but if we are on high alert we're not likely to be able to enter those sleep states or if we are, it'll be for much shorter times because our bodies are going to be more mm-hmm. preoccupied with keeping us alive rather than going on like the secondary piece. Like always our brain is, the, our, the, the priority is on keeping us alive. <laughs> like I can't say that anymore. And even though we might think that they are objectively like safe, their nervous system doesn't know that. Um, and you know, we just need to like give them lots and lots of like cues of safety and able to allow them to get, sleep. there is no making anybody sleep. So, so let's go back and talk a little bit about sleep hygiene, because I feel like that is, um, that's a phrase that we hear a lot. And I feel yeah. like that's where a lot of parental pressure comes in because Mm -hmm. I'm being fed information that says sleep hygiene looks this way. And if, and so if your child's not sleeping well, it's because they're not doing their good sleep hygiene. So, um, let's, let's kind of, (laughs) let's do this because we're going to dig way in. So, um, because Heather and I are both, um, we're, we're, we're a ways down this PDA journey and, Mm -hmm. um, and have learned a lot the hard way um, about, about how to create that nervous system safety to Mm -hmm. prepare for sleep. Um, so, uh, Heather, why don't you go first? And so just, just talk a little bit about, I know, surprise, um, talk a little bit about, (laughs) um, what, what does bedtime look like in your home and what what is your what's your your sleep routine um i remember being told all the time well if you just have a really consistent bedtime routine you know so so heather kind of just describe what what is your really good bedtime you know what's this routine what does it look like in your home working up to Um, bedtime because personally our What bedtime looks like in our house is I go into my bedroom and I shut the door and I ask my son not to make a lot of noise at night so that I can sleep. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> that's that is our you know but but we're at a point where you know he's independent he's 13 i don't have to you know we've we've set up the house to where it's safe for my son and us to be you know where he can be on his own at night um we because we spent years and years and years with sleep doctors and sleep psychologists oh. and well but you know when you know better you do better right um, no, when, um, I was, I was actually like, oh, because that, that sounds really stressful. That sounds really, yeah. really stressful. It sounds right. like, and it really, and it really wasn't, that. it really, really wasn't until we, um, stopped going to public school. You know, we mm -hmm. had the expectations of getting up at a certain time, being at school at a mm -hmm. certain time. And even though we had it written in his IEP that, you know, because of these, you know, comorbidities that he had that, you know, we as parents could say, hey, he didn't sleep last night, therefore he's not coming to school and it's mm -hmm. not going to be, you know, counted against his attendance or whatever. Um, and just like you said at the beginning of this, Suzanne, you know, when the pandemic hit, it was like one of the best things that ever happened to us yeah, because, yeah. you know, it all those expectations were just gone. You know, it was just that we were homeschooling anyway. Um, mm -hmm. We just we we allowed him to just kind of exist the way he needed to exist and this was you know about the same time the pandemic hit is when we really started gearing up and um uh learning more about pda and what a pda you know supporting pda in, in the household would look like um mm -hmm. and so we you know what is it what does sleep look like now we do about, you know, he's got about, a, 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 let's see, a schedule, sort of, if we think about a month, um, where he is up during the day, sleeping at night for about three weeks, and then it mm -hmm. shifts for about a week, and, we you know, we fully uh, expect oh, it, yeah. and we don't, you know, it's like, it's just the way it is, um, so, and he stays up. I, do you yeah, want to find a question? So are you noticing that his sleep time is going forwards a few hours, uh, like through the clock or is it just like, is he like a, if he's, if he's like a non 24, like yeah, where he's that's, just, that's yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if I have the data on, that. I mean, I honestly, we, we exist like without clocks and time anymore. Yeah, you know, okay. if that makes sense, you know, it, yeah. it just, we just don't, you're on PDA time. I'm, just, I, I'm not worried. Exactly. We're on, and then also my husband, my husband has that de delayed sleep. Yeah. It's I mean, genetic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. So, you know, we just, I have a family of people who stay up late when I don't. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and so just to, so earlier on, and I can't remember whether this was when we were recording or when we were chatting beforehand, but we did. Um, so there was um, a comment about how, you know, um, neurodivergents don't tend to sleep. I just want to say there are many, many people who are not being picked up in the stats because, you know, unless you're a squeaky wheel, you don't mm -hmm. get caught. Um, I was a baby who slept for 22 hours of the day. And that is well outside the range of normal. However, my mother also had a another child who was the opposite and a very, very hands-on, like very diff. Yeah, I'm just gonna say it, like he was very, very difficult. Um, and uh, the like, the behavior was. Um, uh, oh gosh, I mean, we know the story, and this is back in the '80s too, when like the the like narrative around this was awful and so my mom didn't flag anything with this she was just like thrilled that she didn't have like a newborn and then a, a baby like awake throughout the night and crying a lot um because she also had a three-year-old who was doing the same like a three and a half year old um four-year-old and um so like it isn't like we have this narrative and i think um we don't know a, an awful lot about it because um the studies even the whole like melatonin autistics not producing enough melatonin thing is 
very much on shaky ground. And um, so myself and if anybody um, knows, Laura Helfeld. So she is a neurodivergent nurse um, consultant. I want to say nurse consultant. I'm so sorry, Laura, if I got that wrong. Um, she's also a PDA. -er. Um, she is an excellent, excellent resource. Um, and um, she was telling me um, about how that study with the melatonin had not been able to be reproduced, hmm. huge red flag, and um, that it seemed to be that they, they were just like testing it at the wrong time. So they, they were saying that um, autistics don't produce enough melatonin when actually they, the time that they mm -hmm. were testing, it was likely too early on for those people who are night owls. So they wouldn't have had like enough melatonin in the system anyway. Now I won't go off on melatonin because that is a huge subject and we could talk on that for a couple of hours um, <laughs> because I am really, um, I am really against melatonin supplementation for our autistic children. I feel like it is a mass scale in experiment essentially on a group that are highly vulnerable and highly with highly sensitive systems. And I think that it's, it's a growth hormone and um, we are seeing um, a lot of issues coming up with it along with like diabetes and, and like, you know, um, delayed onset. I mean, I, I, let's not go into that bit. <laughs> However, um, so the real lateness, let's go back into like societal expectations and school, how, oh my God, what, right, Heather, can I ask, what time did school start for your son when he was in school? I, I think he was getting on the bus at like seven in the morning. That's yeah. so hard. I would be dead. Seven. I yeah. mean, it was, I'm just, I'm, it's been a while now. I like, I can remember putting him on the bus, you know, when it was still dark, you know, when the that time so, changed and yeah, that's harsh. And, um, it's really bad. Like ours, when you think about it, it's a school, I know that I know the reason behind this. It's all about supporting parents who need to work. Right. But that is actually really disruptive um, in an incredibly negatively impact way um, to our children who are developing and they need their sleep. We actually have <clears throat> the way that sleep architecture, so sleep architecture for anybody um, who would like to know is essentially like, like you think about like how, uh, the architecture of a building is what a building looks like sleep architecture is what sleep looks like so like when the various stages tend to happen throughout the, the night and um like it's not just that we go on on cycles and each cycle is the same we find that we have more deep sleep at the start of our sleep onset like close to our sleep onset and then we have more REM sleep towards the end so if you are cutting off sleep at a point when they haven't receive their adequate amount of cycles. Um, at the very end of that sleep, what you're cutting is a lot of REM sleep. And most neurodivergents need more REM sleep, not less, because we take in so much more information from the world. So we need to sift through more in sleep. We need to defrag that brain. We need to get that short-term memory stored completely emptied out to start afresh for the day. And when we don't get that, what is impacted? It's our memory, our, it's our executive functioning ability, it's our sensory processing, it's our emotional regulation. And those are putting on like clinical terms on things which are basically like, when I'm tired, I am going to be more feisty or more like quick to get sad or angry or frustrated. Of course I am because my capacity is less. If I am tired, um, I mean, even down to this, like when we think about our sensory needs when we're tired, I mean, one, our senses are generally amplified when we're tired. Um, I mean, like, yes, yeah, there are some people, of course there are like within, you know, the spectrum of people, not just like neurodivergents. Um, but um, they'll tend to have like, 
you know, more, um, they'll take in more um, sensory information is stronger. So like things like your startle reflex will mm -hmm. be more quick to, to trigger. If there's like some noise behind you, whereas if you're not tired, it might not affect you. When you are tired, it might make you jump out of your skin. And that huge cortisol release that you have when you jump and how it stays with you and how that impacts you through the day Things like I, when I'm tired, I like to wrap myself up in like a thick something. I want that heavy pressure when also my interoception is really rubbish. So I'll end up overheating a lot because mm -hmm. I am tired. So I want something to like wrap around me, but I won't figure out that I'm too hot. I get dehydrated quickly. I get frequent headaches. I end up like lightheaded, all this type of stuff. Then we turn into like executive functioning. So, oh my God, short-term memory. Who has short-term memory when they are like sleep deprived? And this is chronic sleep deprivation when it's like school and you can't make up for a deficit. It doesn't matter how much that you sleep in on other times, you cannot make up for a deficit. Um, and um, like, even just like, can you think, like how forgetful I am so like, okay, yes, of course. I'm also um, autistic ADHD, but I also know many neurotypicals who are like, they are ultimately debilitated. De de hang on, help me out the word. I want to say debilitated. debilitated. Thank you so much. <laughs> but they are like when you're sleep deprived, like you end up putting the, like the sugar in the fridge along with your car keys and the mobile phone goes in the oven. And that's just the neurotypical experience who doesn't have like all of this additional excess. And yes, as neurodivergence, we typically sleep less than the average. However, we actually need more than the average because sleep is actually well, we know it's like incredibly like restful, um, restorative, it's healing to our bodies. It's like, it helps our brains to be able to like figure things out, learn, um, you, you know, get back to baseline. And if we don't have that, then we are working constantly impacted. Um, so, so I think, so I think like one of the things that I'm kind of picking up on here is, um, one of the struggles that we have is, is we know how critical sleep is. Yeah. We're also, we, we have people who yes, like are how do naturally do need to sleep later in the night. So they're not yeah. going to go to bed at nine o'clock. Their, their body is not ready. Um, yeah. and so allowing them to reach that sleep just naturally. So if you, yeah. if you do need to watch your tablet longer, letting them go to sleep at that not typical bedtime, letting them kind of yeah. find it on their own. And, and then one of the things that I'm hearing that seems really critical is then they need to sleep in the morning. Um, and, and so one of, this is a, a cultural issue because we, as our physical bodies, we have to have that sleep. Um, and, and we're jerking kids out of bed early in the morning and then wondering why they can't function or why they're grumpy. Um, yeah. and, and so that's kind of that thing in the morning and why, why it's hard to get up in the morning is because they, they run on kind of a different mm -hmm. schedule. Um, and, and so to, to me, and this is what we practice in our life is, um, uh, just allowing that natural mm -hmm. sleep cycle to, to just flow naturally. So, um, with both of my children being autistic, I took them out of public school, um, quite a few years ago. And, and my daughter sometimes likes to bounce back in cause she's PDA and that's what they they do. They got to explore everything. Um, and, and so for us, um, my daughter, she's naturally a night owl. That's, that's like when her energy is like, it's the creative spiking. hour, isn't it? That's, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's she's so she's so creative. And and so when we were trying to like tamp that down, um, Mm. you know, it would turn into explosive issues um, and episodes. And then everybody is like, how do you sleep when you're super dysregulated and upset? And and she'd be like, but now you're mad at me. So um, Mm. we we set up um, more of like it's a quiet time. It's mm-hmm. my bedtime because I'm an early mm-hmm. to bed. And, and so Me too. We, we said, you, you can do your thing. You just need to be respectful of me sleeping. Mm-hmm. So be quiet. And like, mm-hmm. you can actually be up and play in your mm-hmm. room. You could watch your shows. You could play Barbies. You could color. What, yeah. You know, you just can't be too noisy for me. So, yeah. I mean, how often does that happen? She is who she is. Um, yeah. but, but then on the other side, allowing her to reach sleep when her body is ready for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then letting her sleep as late as she needs. And, um, she loves that independence of the nighttime when there's no one to hassle her. She loves it. Yeah. And so right now we've shifted into, um, she's, she's almost nocturnal and, um, she's staying up very, very late at night. She might go to bed at midnight. Sometimes it's like two or 3 AM. And, um, and then she's sleeping a large portion of the day during the day. And, and this really goes against like the norm or the typical, Mm -hmm. but what we found is she's getting better quality sleep Mm -hmm. because she's reaching it on her own. Mm -hmm. And, um, so then her, her mood is way better. Um, Mm -hmm. and she's more peaceful and she's more calm because she really is getting the sleep that she needs. Um, and so that when she wakes up, even if it's afternoon, she's more inclined to want to engage, whether it's with friends or with us or, you know, do, do an activity. Um, and the other thing kind of like Heather was talking about, like how it, it shifts in cycles or whatever. Um, Mm. if she wants to go to bed early because she has chosen to do something tomorrow in the morning, we now allow her that choice and that, and Mm. that freedom and that flow for her to find and for her like that autonomy to go, what does my body need Yeah. and what do I want? And to be able to make that choice, like, you know what? I want to go to bed at 10 o'clock tonight because I really want to get up and, and do this specific thing earlier in the morning. And so we, we found that by um, backing off, and, yeah. and not, and me not trying to regulate her sleep, me not trying to sleep train her that yeah. she actually is able to recognize what her body needs and to find that, that sleep that works for her. Um, and because now she's able to reach sleep peaceful, she's not, she's not needing all that extra regulation from me. And now yeah. I... I get to go to sleep and at the time the bit, that I need. Yes. And the bit that I really want to point out with this is, so yes, um, we can do a lot of things that will negatively impact our sleep. And obviously if we are doing like high dopamine activities at a time when our body needs to be winding down, then we're going to be like, not quite figuring out that we are tired enough to go to sleep. However, we need the very basics. We need to have that foundation covered first. And that foundation really is on regulation. Mm -hmm. And then when you said about how, when you allow your child to get the adequate sleep that they need, they are able to sense more in their body. And with PDA, there is absolutely no making them do anything. And when we look about all the things, because you need to sleep well, you need to live well to be able to sleep well, to be able to live well. It's a cycle. So if you are running 
on a deficit, you're like, it doesn't matter how, how you put this, like from a clinical perspective or like as a mother and a, a human being, like you engage, we all engage in um, really unhealthy things when we are tired. We are generally predisposed to be like gra grabbing quick food that is high in fat and sugar because that is what our body is priming us to grab for. Um, we are like going to be seeking um in te like stimulus of any kind um and all those things are going to be like ramping up our bodies um but if we are able to sleep well we are more in tune with what our body needs we're more likely to eat well we're more likely to feel like exercising uh, you know however that comes across and when when we really have to work on sleep the very basic is getting that foundation in of like getting that rest. So like I have clients who the, the sleep situation is exceptionally intense and they might have these, these children who are awake throughout the day and the night, like all through, like it just seems like they're just not sleeping, but they're very young too and they cannot be left alone. Mm -hmm. And so the very, very first thing is how do we just like create this nest of rest for the whole family to just rest because we need to work on the child being able to rest. The child is not gonna be able to rest unless the parent is well rested. Like, how do we do that? Just that one foundational piece is there. Don't worry about what they're eating. Don't worry about like their daylight hours. Don't worry about any of the stuff. I just don't want you to worry. I just want you to all just like chill out so that you can get like your start feeling what your body is like wanting to do and feel safe enough to just go with the flow without being like triggered into you know like have to sleep because you're not gonna sleep then after that when that those like lines are you know when those foundations are properly in then you can start bringing in things that are like um so like if your child has like a sensory profile that they need additional support with being a, like with senses like maybe they need a sensory diet maybe they need some heavy pressure work during the day to be able mm -hmm. to have like this sensory you know you know inputs um everything like you know signaling like correctly in that by doing that with play regardless of age um we are able to access play many times we are so stressed and so sleep deprived we cannot access play like even down to like your pda pulls a prank and instead of laughing at it you rage at it because you're really pissed that they just threw a glass of cold water on you whereas if you were well rested you might just be able to laugh that off and then you all get some feel goods right Play is feel good. It's the opposite of depression. And it all just builds on itself because we can't, when we think about sleep, yes, we do need to look at the whole thing. We need, like, health is so dependent on it. Eating well, sleeping well, breathing well is another thing. Um, like, being part of the world grounding ourselves by being outside none of that is going to happen unless you are feeling well rested and calm and safe and seen and validated and all those other things yeah um there this is this is such an a uh, um an amazing subject there's there's so much that goes into mm -hmm. sleep and um i i think we're gonna have to do a part two because I still have so <laughs> mm -hmm. many questions. Yep. Um, and, and so we're definitely going to have, um, sleep part two because there's, there's so much more to go into this. And, and I think a mm -hmm. lot, a lot of what needs to happen is as parents, we need to break down those unrealistic expectations um yeah. that, that have been put onto us of like this is what it mm -hmm. this is what it looks like mm -hmm. and and be able to embrace being neurodivergent and, and that our needs are vastly different and different. and and that means that we're we're going to you know have little ones where we we do need to give them that 
regulation and that peace during the day so that they do have that calmness to fall asleep. And that, that might look like I can remember building um, a blanket fort in the living room and, and having toys in there and movies going and being in the, like cuddling in the fort together and they would play around me and I would sleep and, but we were together. And, and, and so that's, you know, being able to kind of break your, yourself free of that, of the expectations and go that Mm. it's actually okay. If, if mama makes a fort and then sleeps in it in the middle of the day, that's okay because I I had that little one who was if that's where you're at um, mm-hmm. almost she was almost five before she slept through the night and so that that meant we had to get a little bit creative on making rest and um, and so now now giving her the space to just be awake and sleep when she needs it um, I I think. Mm-hmm a huge subject that we need to discuss in part two is um, the whole co-sleeping situation, because Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, you know, you're talking about like your, your deep rooted genetic needs is to, is to be together. And then we're like, now go in your own room far away and do not come in here. And, and so I think that is huge. And there's so much pressure from the medical community not to co-sleep, which I understand. You know, I understand. Anyway, that's, we are definitely going to need to put this in there too. Because, because, you know, you feel, I I remember feeling like a closet co-sleeper because it was the only way anybody was going to get any sleep. But then you take your child into their like one month well baby and they're like, where does your child sleep? Where do you sleep? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, and just thinking, okay, well, I can tell you the truth or I can lie. You know, what, what, what do you want? Because. Yeah. And that's um, the thing is that and- actually, I think um, a, a lot of people actually don't disclose it. Um, we know yeah. that at least 75% of people do co- do bed share. Mm-hmm. And, and the issue is, and I'll say this before we go, but we will totally take a deep dive into this, is that when people do it and they do it without um, adequate knowledge on what is safe infancy, safe. then they do it unsafely, or that they avoid it to the point where they're like dead men walking and they end up falling asleep with mm-hmm. their baby sat on a sofa. Of course you would. If mm-hmm. you people fall asleep at the wheel of a car mm-hmm. with the wind blaring in their face and the radio full blast, of course you are going to fall asleep mm-hmm. when you, your brain is being, your body is actually primed to sleep when you are breastfeeding. Um, you're absolutely shattered. You're in a warm and cozy environment and that's when people fall asleep on a sofa, which is highly, highly dangerous. Yet it is not unsafe. I am going to say this categorically. We know that it is not unsafe. So look at the world or works of say, for instance, um, Dr. James McKenna, who is an anthropologist, um, anthropologic, yeah, he, he works with anthropology. I'm so sorry. Um, and, um, Dr. Helen Ball, um, you know, the La Leche League, which actually is a really mm-hmm. great resource on safe infant mm-hmm. sleep. And when you look at SIDS rates, so sudden infant death syndrome, um, it's not linked with safe infant, not safe, sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm getting a bit distracted because my son <laughs> is at the window. I'm going to have to go very soon. Uh-huh. He's desperate for his bike, which is in here. But um it's not unsafe to sleep with your baby. It is unsafe to co- to bed share yes. under certain things. Mm-hmm. Like if you are extremely sleep deprived, yes, mm-hmm. that is a, a hazard. If you are in an environment where there are like suffocation hazards, like mm-hmm. pillows, heavy blankets, all that type of thing. Yes, 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 yes. The safest place for your baby is actually on their back right next to your breast at breast height without anything else around. And they are more safe than in their crib alone. So I'm going to leave um, you with that because that is a very important thing to them. I, I think, yeah, I think that we, we're going to have to do another. I also think um, there's a lot of people who are afraid, a lot of mothers who are afraid to admit that their older children 
want to sleep in their bed or in their bedrooms. And, um, and so that's a very interesting subject to go mm-hmm. into. Um, and, uh, yeah. can I just say one thing to that? There is a statistic, which is about the high prevalence of teenage depression and mental health issues. And one in two teenagers deal with that alone. And I would rather my teenager be in bed with me and not dealing with something Mm -hmm. alone than Mm -hmm. on their own. And that's all I am going to say to that because they are more likely to be going through mental health issues when they are alone and unseen and unsupported than in your bed. Um, There's nothing wrong with co-sleeping at any point in life. We're going to, we're going to do a part two, Suzanne, if, People yeah. want to learn more about you if they want to get connected in with you. What What's the best way for people to follow um, you, hear totally, from you? Yeah, totally on Instagram. Um, I actually, my capacity is beyond any other social media. I've picked one channel and that's it. That's Instagram. So I am themotherload.nd.sleep. Um, my website, if you wanted to check out anything else is, um, motherloadsleepspecialist.com. Um, and I'm also, um, just about to release my own podcast with my co-host who is infant sleep specialist, so infant sleep scientist, sorry, um, Jess Guy. And that is called nurturing neurodivergence, um, not C E, but N T S as in like plural. Um, and that's going to be releasing in August. <laughs> we haven't actually got a date yet, but I'm really excited to get that out there just because I feel like there's a lot of conversations that need to happen in this space with a, you know, with a wide range of experiences. I love the fact that you are doing this coffee chat, guys. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. I appreciate you so much. And if you would like to learn more about pathological demand avoidance profile of autism, uh, you can check out our website, which is journeyswithpda.com. We have Facebook and Instagram. And um, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and to the video podcast on YouTube. So um, thank you, Suzanne, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.